Hi, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yep. yes. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm so sorry I'm not there in person. I was really intending to be there in person and then forces worked against me. So I'm presenting online. But thank you so much for keeping me on the schedule. I really appreciate this opportunity. And um, I hope that I present a meaningful presentation for you all. So we're here to talk about what we really mean by content first design. And I'm sure all of you have been involved in web redesign projects and have all started out with the best intentions of how you want that process to unfold and what pieces you need in what order. And sometimes it happens well and sometimes it goes awry. So let's uh, talk about your situation. So assuming that you're about to embark on a new website redesign project, you need the support and participation of key stakeholders. And you may need content revisions or you may need complete content rewrites. And you want those to uh, impact the design. So you want to start with content first. And this is how that typically goes. Um, <laughs> it can be a little bit of a pull and push. Um, you find a lot of resistance, you find some procrastination. So let's dig into what's really likely going on here for our stakeholders. Um, your resistance might come in the form of questions like this, like, how is the design coming along? Can I see the design first for some inspiration? A lot of times, um, your key stakeholders and your subject matter experts really want to see um, they really want to see like a mock-up of the home page or they worry that if they work on content, they're going to be holding up the design or the whole process. And they also feel like they don't know where to begin without seeing some sort of sample of what it's going to look like. And they're worried they're going to base their content on the pre-existing design. So you want to start with the content and you're feeling that pushback. They all want to see mock-ups and design with lorem ipsum text so that they have word counts. And the thing is, is that your key stakeholders are not necessarily wrong. Um, for example, a lot of them feel like this is how they've always done it. And it, to be honest, it is how we've done it in the past. We've given them design mockups with lorem ipsum text and given them sort of a place to start kind of like this. And they go from there. They kind of pick out the content they want in each section and write it up for you. Um, they're also used to thinking with visual or spatial aids for planning out a content in a visual environment. So they may be used to seeing wireframes or prototypes similar to this. And this sort of helps them gauge how much content they have room for. And most of all, they're looking for the rules. So they don't want to fail because A, they don't want to let anyone down. They also don't want to spend their time writing a bunch of content that won't fit. So they decide that they're going to hold back and see if they can get those designs out of you first. So your mission is to collaborate together on the important stuff to reduce both those rewrites and those redesigns. Okay, so first let's talk about content first defined as best we can. Um, so I'm gonna start with what is art versus what is design. Art exists for its own sake. It's that self-defining thing. It, so it can cause all the reactions in you that design can, like that fear, awe, delight, surprise, but its existence is prima facie. It's for its own sake. It's not for the sake of anything else. Whereas design, on the other hand, exists for its function. So we judge the success of a design by how well it serves that function. So something like this, you know, you see beautiful artwork versus something that has to be comfortable, has to hold a certain amount of weight, has to be um, something that's easy to sit down on and get off of, like, you know, the first image, the painting doesn't have to, um, doesn't have to serve any function other than to be pretty. So 
What is the function of a higher ed website? While the design system or the layout of a site might seem like its foundation, it's more of a container for that functionality and those purposes of your site. So your functionality, your purpose of your site is what you want your audiences to know, what you want them to feel, and what you want them to do about it. So your web design is meant to complement your content. It's not that your content complements your web design. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about content first. Um, it's so hard. I can't see any of you, so I don't know if there's any questions so far. And I feel like I'm speeding through, but hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions afterwards. Okay, so why content first? Web design is about creating patterns for common content or messaging types. So pattern recognition is that cornerstone of human cognition. You want to make sure that you have your information displayed in a patterned way because you want to relieve that cognitive overload. And we all experience that on a day-to-day -day basis with having multiple tabs and multiple, oh, if folks, sorry, I just saw a uh, note that if folks have questions to be sure to submit them in the question and answer function. Okay, sorry, I'll keep going. So. Um, it, so you have that cognitive overload and you want to relieve that cognitive load for your stakeholders, your site visitors. You want them to come to your site and have everything feel very easy and predictable. Um, also, when you create patterns for your messaging types, you also create memorability because people kind of connect the visual with the message itself. When there's no pattern, they can't assemble that connection. So you're only hitting them with the words or the visuals. You're not blending those together to create that experience that they will connect with and remember later on. And you want the user to reasonably predict what's coming next. I know in terms of UX, like user experience, we often think of delight. And sometimes surprise and delight come together. But realistically, when someone can predict what they're going to see next, it means that your information architecture and it means that your design are setting them up to find what they need. It increases that findability. Okay, so creating meaningful visual patterns for the user. Um, to follow can happen once we decide what those semantic patterns are. So a common type of content you might have on your website could be program descriptions or current student quotes. A common type of meaning would be those key messages like built with local partners so that your curriculum is very job focused or employment focused. And a type of design pattern would be setting up the difference between symmetrical design and asymmetry, setting up some rhythm along the page, some size and contrast and emphasis, like all of those are different types of design assets that a designer can play with. So all of this creates that, um, that pattern that people are expecting. And so web design becomes creating that visual, vi visual system. And you want to make sure that it is functioning, accessible, and actionable. So it works. Just means that it's functioning, right? But if it's working really well, so it's efficient and effective, and it's aligned with your messaging, that means it's really accessible for you, your users. And if it's clear and people know what action to take, that means it's an actionable website. So that's what you're looking for. You're looking to give them the information in a way that creates feelings or motivations and gives them the next step to take. So what happens when it's layout first? I'm going to give you some examples here in a couple of slides. I didn't do a lot of extra effort to make sure we were hiding who these uh, images came from. So I hope that you'll bear with me. <laughs> um, but so when we try to fit content into a design that we've already invested resources into, that means that we're making hard decisions along the way. We may be leaving out valuable aspe aspects of the message. Um, 
we change the content in ways that will make the message less powerful. We sometimes limit design options for supporting our messages. So um, there won't be those visual elements we need to really create that sense of memorability or that sense of importance. And we spend extra time and resources redesigning web pages so that they do complement the content. So we're either leaving out the things that matter in our messaging to get it across, or we're redoubling our efforts. And so here are those real design patterns without a lot of context. Okay, so here's an example. This was a design pattern for another client. Um, you can see that they have that header and that basic text and then a link and they have this icon with a circle around it. So what's happening here is that we've added this lorem ipsum text so that we can predict what the pattern will look like for each place that it appears in the website design, but we're only giving them about you know, 20 words in order to complement that header or explain what that header is about and lead them to the next uh, point in their user journey. And what we find often is that sometimes we aren't allowing for enough space or we're allowing for too much space, depending on what those key messages are. So you want to know what those key messages are ahead of time so that this design pattern works for every instance. Here's another common example that we see a lot in web design for higher ed, where a designer will create these bubbles like the 90% employment or 42,000 average salary. But we know as content creators for a site like this that we need to offer our users a little bit more information about what they're seeing. Otherwise, those numbers are meaningless. So 90% employment, does that mean that the people that work at the university are only employed 90% of the time? Does it mean that 90% of graduates get employed? Does that mean that 90% of students are employed while they're attending classes? That 90% employment is not immediately clear what it's conveying. So you need a little bit more information. The 42,000 average salary, what is that conveying? Is that for someone that graduates with this degree? Is that for um, a yearly salary? Like it, it's just not abundantly clear what the statistic is for this program. And if a student, a prospective student can't make that connection immediately, it means they won't see and connect with this data. Here's another example of a pattern where you know, we thought that this would appear all over the site, that they'd use this image on the left and this secondary title and a short paragraph on the right. The truth is, is this is just not the way that that content ever, un ever worked well for our client, that they never had this sequence where they had a horizontal image like that and just a very short paragraph where these two things complemented each other well. So we tried to encourage people to have more uh, vertical imagery so that it would fit their content better, but their design assets, they just didn't have a lot of photography with vertical imagery inside. So what ended up happening is you have one column that's really long next to this little tiny image, and it doesn't seem to connect that well or look like a well-balanced design. Okay. Here's another example of design systems gone awry. <laughs> Here you'll see that there's no visual elements to break up the pattern of the page at all. So this is a page that's continued into that other column. Um, what's tricky about this is there's no visual elements that allow rest for the eye. It's just a complete scan of pure information, all in paragraph text. There's not even some bulleted lists or anything that allow people a break. And so a lot of times when you're designing uh, a visual design system for a higher education website, what you wanna do is you wanna break up pages like this because understanding why you might wanna study management and then looking at student life opportunities, none of these create any kind of importance in the specific information being conveyed. So students don't have that 
memorability experience where they know exactly where something was other than just relying strictly on reading through the entire thing and kind of remembering, well, it was somewhere near the beginning or it was somewhere near the end. And when you don't have headers and design elements um, that support your content, what you wind up with are pages where people use nothing and they create pages with very little information because they want to make sure that the information is clear. So what they do is they force that job on the navigation to make content clearer or more important. And they do that by directing people to go to multiple pages rather than being able to find all the information they need on just a few pages. Okay, so your tactics. If you are working with reluctant writers, what you want to do is you want to help them kind of figure out how to lay out their content without making it so they feel like they're doing it irrespective of a design. So there's a couple of different approaches that I like to take. I like to take the approach of helping them outline a user journey first. Sometimes that makes the content flow a little easier. I also like to work with them about what are those messages and content priorities that they want to make sure they're conveying on each page or each program page, what are the clear things that they want people to take away from that information. And that often helps to relieve some of the anxiety or the reluctance to write the content without a design. The other thing I like to do is make it as easy as possible and give them plenty of options. In other words, I like to trick them a little bit <laughs> into giving me the content first. So the way that I go about doing this, let's talk about outlining the user journey. So this is a really simple example of a user journey. Your user journeys may be more complex than this, but you can think about the first stage as developing awareness about your school and programs. The second phase is being about that prospective student taking into consideration your unique features and benefits. The third stage is that application stage. So it's working through instructions, and it might be connecting with admissions counselors or program advisors. And that last stage is understanding um, your cost and price information and what they're getting into and finally making that commitment. So if you map out a user journey with your key stakeholders like this, they can think about the content that a user may need in that awareness stage. So they'll need to know programs, the location of the school, what living is like, what the size of the campus is like, and what that general vibe is. So they understand for awareness what people are looking for. When your school is under serious consideration, that's when they're looking at you against competitors. So that's when they want to know more details about your program. What makes your program special? What makes your program like that other program that's more expensive, but you could get it for a cheaper price at this particular location. Um, those are the kinds of things that you want to convey in that consideration phase, okay? And then the content that complements the application phase is clear instructions in what schools are looking for. And in that commitment phase, the content that people would be looking for is that connection and communication with um, the staff and faculty at your school. So if you kind of lay it out like this for your stakeholders, they kind of know how to answer these questions. And so what you're doing is you're garnering information from them. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the way that's going to fit your website design at first, but you want to make sure that you get all of those key points and so that you know what's going to be important to design around. Okay. Determining your key messages and content priorities. I'm going to show you, like, I just did a dump of every priority key message that appears regularly in higher education. These slides will be available if you want to see this later on. But the idea is 
give them a list like this and have them circle the two or three that are meaningful to their program. Give them something to start with so that they know like these are the things that are really going to make a difference or these are the items that I really want prospective students to walk away with and understand and be able to repeat back if I ask them what do you remember from this web page. When they start with something like this, it gives you a sense of what kind of content messages you're going to be wanting to design specific um, design elements for. And how do your key messages shape your page outline? So if you look at that first slide I did with the awareness, the consideration, the application, and the commitment. Now you're looking at something like, say they circled, let's go back, say they circled opportunities for cooperative education, um, growing program, and academic coaching available. Okay, so those are the three things that they want to see um, emphasized on their program page. Now, if you say that those are the key messages, does that change the order of the content sections? Do you wanna make sure that cooperative education fits up high in this messaging architecture, or do you want it right in the middle? Do you want um, academic coaches to appear before that? Does it change at what point they're going to be engaging with that kind of information? Do you want them to know that on the first time they visit your site or when you're under consideration in terms of your competitors in relation to other options? And so then you'll think about the design elements that make those messages memorable. So if it's academic coaches, do you want you know, a photo of an academic coach working with a student? Do you want um, a quote from a student that's worked with an academic coach and what that experience was like. What are the common elements that you'll want to build into each of your program pages that make sure that those key messages are deeply felt? And then, as you see, do you need social proof? Do you need a student story? Do you need examples? Like, what's going to bring that content alive? Um, and you already have images associated with that message. It, do you need some art? direction and production? Do you have photography resources or video? If our prospective students remember just one thing about our program, what should it be? I feel like this is a really effective question to ask key stakeholders when they're resisting putting content to a page before they've seen a design. This will help them think about like the most important thing and focus them in on what you need in order to build out your design. So just like how we like to make it easy for our prospective students, the easier we make it for our internal stakeholders, the more success we'll have. So how do we make it easier for our internal stakeholders? Um, think about the key message you want them to feel. So one of those key messages might be, the web is a really dynamic place and we can change your content easily. Sometimes that's all they need to hear is that the draft that they're creating today is not the thing that they need to live with six months from now. Um, a second key message you may want to emphasize with them is we're gonna test this version and respond to the data. Okay, so that means they have this option of putting something out there as a test, and maybe there's an A-B test, so maybe they have two different types of content that they want to put out there to see which one resonates more, which one brings in different results. That's also relieving some of the anxiety of this being the be-all and the end-all of the content that they're creating. And most importantly, you want to emphasize we're on your side, so if something is not working, we can fix it. If this is not the right content after two years or two weeks. We have options. Um, you want them to feel supported as they're creating this content, and you don't want them to feel like anything about this process ties them to a specific design element that they're just going to have to live with. But you do want to make sure that you have something to base the design around. Okay. So how do you go about conveying those messages or make that process 
um, how do you embed those ideas into a process? So one thing that I like to do is I like to create several short surveys for those subject matter experts that are secretly the keys to a content strategy page table. So I think you've seen page tables before. They're usually about key messages. They're identifying the audience. They're identifying steps that the audience needs to take in order for that page to have been successful. Um, they're identifying calls to action. So if you frame that in something that someone has time to digest over a period of days and then respond to with relative ease, you'll get content back. Now, is it ready to go directly into a site? No, but we're going to edit their content anyway. So we might as well get something back and not tell them that they are doing the writing for our website and that that's going to be the draft we're going to base the design around. We don't have to tell them that up front. That's one option. Um, when you do this, only ask for as much content as you can use. So just in the exact same way that we survey students and we're careful to not ask them questions upon which we plan to take no action on, you can do that same thing with your internal audiences. You can make sure that you're only asking them for as much information as you have the capacity to realize. You can also ask for help from their students, and you can ask your faculty to recommend students to talk to. You can ask your student services and student affairs professionals if they have students to connect you with, and ask those students what content's going to be meaningful to them that sort of help builds your data case for where things need to be inside a user journey. It also helps students um, to feel invested in a process of making their university website and experience better for future students. And it kind of helps relieve some of the anxiety and some of the pressure that you're putting on your internal stakeholders from uh, how do we write this content angle. Um, and I always like to give faculty and staff a opt out for now option. It, with this very open invitation to come back and re-enter the process. So if they are just not into it, forcing them to write content for you is not going to be the way to build trust and consensus around a process. Unfortunately, sometimes we all work with people that resist us and want to procrastinate on these type of things because they feel like this process is going to lead to the website that's going to represent them for years to come. And some of that is a little bit true. So they're going to be reluctant to come to any decision point and feel like they're putting their thumb on the scale for how this design is going to work for them. So the more you can give them flexibility in that process and build that into your design flow, the more likely they are to come back and engage with you as they need to. And they will once they see other people making progress. They just need that time, I think, sometimes to feel like they can see it work out for other people. Okay, so that is a quick run through of my presentation <laughs> under 30 minutes. Um, but I would really like to turn this into a conversation. And I know that you probably have a lot of questions about how to make this more effective. And I feel like those questions, like those examples uh, are what we learn from. So please ask away. <laughs> yeah, I have a mic in the room. I don't see anything on the Q&A and Zoom, but if, you, if folks wanna put on, uh, put their questions in the Q&A and Zoom, we can take a couple of those, but also take, uh, I'll pass the mic around in the room if people have questions as well. So if you see one on Zoom, you can take that one real quick. Okay, so I see a Q and A thing. Ah, I can't seem to get it open. Hold on. Um, I can ask it for you if you like. Oh yeah, sure. That might help. Yeah. So Kara, uh, Kara asks, what advice do you have for breaking up text on web pages, such as with images, for content that is more formal, serious, or policy purpose, i.e doesn't have a natural or appropriate images that would make sense or concern that it might be, it might detract from the formality of the information. Yes. Okay. So I used to work at the University of Minnesota, 
Minnesota and academic support resources. And this was the site where we had a lot of student policy and a lot of information on financial aid, a lot of information on how to register for courses. And you're right, in those cases, there aren't a ton of opportunities to embed imagery of students at a football game wearing all of your campus's gear, or it's not really the right time to put a photo of a student that's doing a science experiment if they're thinking carefully about financial aid or if they're thinking carefully about um, maybe uh, SAP like student academic progress suspension, like it, it, not all pages are meant for images. So again, there could be some design elements that you build into your site that are about creating white space or about creating that emphasis. Sorry, I meant to say negative space. Um, so what you're looking for are elements that break things up like lines on a page, or you may look for ways to draw out emphasis for key points. So those might be textual design elements. Um, you may look for um, just visual design cues that there's a process. So sometimes that might be um, lines uh, vertical lines or using numbers and sequencing. Um, so it might help with like a timeline if you're drawing people through a process. The key, I think, is to use design elements that support the tone. So if you are like I've seen a lot of people try to work in icons. I wouldn't necessarily recommend icons unless they are a visual connection to a very specific kind of content that is repeatable throughout your site. But you want to allow for some design elements to help support when content changes in um, it, like when you have different subjects. I don't know if this is helpful. Help me out. Tell me if this is answering the question or if it's not. Yeah, we'll wait for uh, Kara to chime back in. Um, oh. There's a couple other ones too. Um, also, if folks have uh, questions in the room, just like show a hand. Uh, Letty asks, do you have any suggestions for working with content creators in a decentralized structure where they manage their own content that are often not experts in the web content? Okay, so they manage content, but they're not experts in that content. Or you're not experts in that content. Um, I think the tricky thing about working with a decentralized team for producing content and for getting it right is helping them see what's going to be most effective. So there may be some professional development you can do around content strategy. And some ways that you might wanna go about that are um, providing examples of copy that say basically the same thing, but in two different ways. Um, I like to provide, when I do a content strategy workshop, I like to emphasize that the smartest people, the people with PhDs and with legal degrees that are ingesting the deepest, thickest content, prefer plain language, prefer short and to the point as much as possible. And sometimes I think that in academies, we can go really big and really go into the depth of explaining something. But if you keep focusing their attention on the fact that our attention capacities are limited, that we want clear, actionable content, and we want it to be short and engaging, that that's sort of a way that supports that decentralized content creation thing. Um, but I mean, I think another way to sort of help them is to build community around content strategy. So if you have a decentralized team that's all around creating content. How often are you getting together? 
How often are you reading each other's content and providing feedback? I think if you can create a culture of providing feedback and they could provide feedback of one another. So it's not always feeling like it's coming from that centralized office that's saying your content's too wordy, it's too long, it's too complicated. But if uh, their peers can provide that kind of content back and forth to one another, that can be really helpful. Does that help? Does that answer the question? Yeah, we'll let them uh, chime in on that too. Um, I have a couple of questions here too about um, this this uh, technical theme of content. So Vicki asks, uh, what are some questions or um, asks tips for taking technical research content um, down to useful information? And then Gary chimes in too. He's like, if a project wants to appeal to a lot of audiences, several audiences, both technical and non-technical, how would you recommend presenting that, that information on that technical content? Um, so if it's, if it's a lot of, so if you're trying to present technical and non-technical information to the same audience, is that what you're asking? Like, so there's audience that want the technical information and audience members that don't, or if you're looking at how do you um, create space for research findings or some other very technical information, like how do you do that? How do you deliver that in a way that supports both audiences? Is that sort of the gist? Yeah, it seems like it's a te technical conversation for, you know, making that um, digestible for all audiences, really. Um, okay, so I think that to the greatest extent possible, you're going to want to make sure that your content is focused on your primary audience. And it hurts because I know higher ed websites want their want the world to be their audience. But I think what happens is, is when we try to make content that's for everybody, the content winds up being for nobody. So I think the first part of it is audience prioritization. Who are you trying to reach? What is the call to action? What do you want them to do with this information? And that's going to be a little different on a program page versus going to a press release where someone is um, showcasing findings from a research paper. There's going to be different audiences at different times throughout your site. And the location of that information in your information architecture is going to tell you a lot about who it's for and who's getting to that page. The direction that people go to get to that page. Um, how they find that information is going to be revealing of who that audience is. Likely, reporters are not going to your program pages. Likely, your alumni are not frequently visiting your program pages. They're visiting the alumni section of your website. Reporters are visiting the news and media site uh, section of your site. So your information architecture will inform how you want to create this content. So I don't think that there's an easy way to say some of this content is for technical audiences and some of it is not on the same page in the same section. But assuming that you have to do that, from a user experience perspective, I like to use progressive, ex progressive exposure. So you don't want to necessarily hit them with the hard stuff all at once. <laughs> what you want to do is progress them into deeper areas. So that might be using type scale to make your site very easily scannable. So start with very large fonts. And as you get down into headings that are more nitty gritty, you'll reduce the type scale so that they feel like they are getting to the information that they need in a progressive way. Um, and in terms of creating the ease of that content, you want to make sure that you're writing about this content, uh, about these technical specifications in as easy of a way to digest as possible. So try to break up the points in a visual way um, try to 
simplify the words that you use without losing the meaning, which can be very difficult, but it takes some sophistication in terms of writing. So you may want to bring in other writing professionals if you worry that you're just not getting it, that simplifying dumbs it down too much, but keeping it in jargon makes it inaccessible for people. There's a real tension there. And so I think that the more sophisticated your writing talent, your content strategy is, the better you're going to be able to achieve results that work for most people. Um, and then I would think really heavily, again, about what you want people to do with the content that you're creating. So all your content should answer a question or should motivate someone to an action. People don't go to the website for their health. They don't go to see what your outcomes are. They go to see what your outcomes are so that they know how to make a decision. And you always want to keep that decision in mind, not assume that people are going just to learn about you. That's not what they're doing. They're going to learn about you so that. You always want to answer that so that. Sorry, that was a little rambly. Is that helpful? Yeah, we'll have I them... Uh uh chime in on the q a too i have an in-person question too if you want to take that yeah uh yes uh i certainly agree with you that content should come first but i uh, always struggle especially when you get in you know academic environment the i worry sometimes setting them loose uh you know i'm going to get back a 20 page google doc uh to <laughs> years ago. like how do you you know even though you know i usually try to if I know what I'm going to, if I'm certain that's going to happen, I usually try to kind of start with a very loose wireframe and use all my lore emissions to explain what I'm trying to do, but. Uh, okay. okay. I see what you mean, which is that sometimes a prototype can be a really helpful example to kind of set them along a path so that they're not writing a dissertation for you. <laughs> and I very much understand, like, academics are wordy. I'm wordy. I'm not sure if uh, any of you know Bravery Media, but I write the higher ed hot takes that we send out in our newsletter sometimes, and I have trouble cutting myself off. So I know the struggle with not requesting so much information or, like, asking them to write the content first and then having to figure out what to do with, like, 15 pages. Um, I think... Again, so I, you want to make sure that they're answering user questions. So if you could do a presentation or some professional development about what their audiences are most looking for. So their audience are typically looking for, what is this program about? What am I going to learn? Um, am I going to get a job afterwards? What's it going to cost? Um, what opportunities are there for me to go deeper, to meet other students, to feel like I'm part of a community? Those are the kinds of questions that students have. So you may want to set them up with, these are the things that you're going to want to answer. Um, and then you're going to want to give them the tools to do that in a way that is short and to the point and punchy and helpful and on brand. So having those conversations about what key messages are for your college or your university, your institution, whatever level you want that to be at. So maybe that's at just the department level, but knowing what those key messages are ahead of time, figuring out how they're going to be worked into the content will also help give them a little bit of sure footing in terms of content creation. And then I would say, um, you can talk about word limits. I mean, <laughs> what's going to happen is they're going to roll right past them. <laughs> but I think that in the editing process, you can talk about this does feel too long. This does feel like you're over explaining something to a 17 year old audience that's just investigating colleges for the first time or this isn't enough. It's not giving us a clear picture of what this opportunity really is or what this process is going to be. And you can allow them this opportunity to work in drafts. I think that faculty and staff are used to revise and resubmit. There, It doesn't sound too 
different from what they've known before. Um, and if you're not getting the information that you need, you can coach them in ways and hopefully they'll have budgeted enough mental time for what this will take to get right.